This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What does good policing look like? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Reason Associate Editor Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. New York has called in the troops following a shooting on the A train during rush hour. Governor Kathy Hochul has deployed 1,000 National Guardsmen and police officers to run checkpoints in the subway. Violent crime in America's cities spiked in the years following the pandemic and have somewhat subsided since, but polling shows that crime remains a major concern for many Americans. To talk with us today about crime, policing, civil liberties, and city life is Peter Moskos. Uh, he is a professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and a former Baltimore police officer. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned the perception among the public. I'm just going to pull up a little bit of polling, Gallup polling data here um, that shows 63% at last, uh, when they last checked in, believe that crime is either extremely or very serious in the U.S. That blue line underneath is pretty interesting because when you ask people how is it where you live? It's much, much lower, about 17%. Um, so could you just give us you know, your assessment of how bad or good or like where are we with crime in America at, in 2024? Well, the, the polling data is interesting because a lot of people use that and say that people overestimate crime, um, which is always partly true, by the way. But Another way to look at it is, yeah, most people are safe in the neighborhoods they live in, um, but they're also aware that other people aren't safe. Um, crime is very segregated by geography in America, and uh, certain neighborhoods have a serious problem with crime. I mean, other people, you know, of course, they might be slightly worried, but um, it, it is not a crime isn't something that affects everybody equally in America. Um, so right now we're in a situation, I mean, in 2020, um, after the George Floyd protests and riots, um, crime spiked. And I mention that because it didn't spike with the start of COVID, um, nor did it mm. spike anywhere else in the world because of COVID. Um, I don't want to say COVID doesn't matter, but that was not the, the, the moment. That was not the moment in which crime went up. It was when policing changed mm. um, after, in, in late May and June of 2020. Um, I would argue that it's because, well, police were preoccupied with protests and riots, and also they were under um, what they felt was undue scrutiny because of what an officer in Minnesota did. Um, so proactive policing basically ended. And some of that is because of COVID. The criminal justice system stopped. Courts, um, you know, grinded to a halt, basically, and people were released from prison and jail because of COVID. So it all ties together. But um, a key part is what policing were doing. And since 2020, um, they've been slowly getting back in the game. And you can see this when you look at stats for discretionary police activity for car stops and for low-level arrests. Um, there's a very strong correlation between um, policing, good policing, and and crime. Hmm. Well, so uh, how how true is this? I mean, I'm almost... I'm fascinated by the cities are a hellscape right now narrative. Um, I feel like I've seen lots and lots of crime fears rising. Uh, and it seems like there's a narrative that is taking hold that goes something along the lines of, look, crime rates are really high in some places. You know, D.C. residents very much feel this way right now. We had homicide spikes in a lot of cities over the course of 2020 and 2021. And now, even if in many places, D.C. is a notable exception, that homicide spike has gone down a little bit and the homicide rates are a little bit less bad than they were there's still a sense that there's, you know, fentanyl everywhere and people are crouched over in the city streets and there's, you know, very um, awful issues with drug addiction and homelessness on display and public spaces being uh, perceived to be less safe than they used to be. How true is the hellscape narrative right now? Well, you and I live in New York. It's, I mean, it's vastly overblown. Um, we go about our daily lives and New York is still, I think, a wonderful place to, to live and work. but that it doesn't mean that there aren't serious public disorder problems. 
Um, I think a lot of this has to be sort of disaggregated in the sense that there is a public order problem and there is a violent crime problem and they're not necessarily the same problem. Um, similarly, I don't like looking at national, I don't believe in the concept of national trends in crime because crime is local. Um, <laughs> what happens in Portland doesn't impact people who live in DC and vice versa. Um, so there can be a similar nationwide happening that affects crime in different places, but but the, the cause and effect is always local. Um, and that's why you do get violence increases in some cities and decreases in others. Um, I had a piece recently in Vital City where I talked about this. It's not that there's a tide or some magnetic force, some magical thing in the air that impacts crime everywhere in the world. Um, no, it, it's what happens at a local level politically. It's what happens at a local level um, in terms of which laws are passed. And, it what ha and it's what happens at a local level in terms of policing. Hmm. So um, I want to pull up some of this uh, data and get your analysis of it, because uh, what I have here are some of the crime trends in U.S. cities, uh, which is tracked by the Council on Criminal Justice. And you mentioned that spike. This is showing the monthly homicide rate across 35 cities that they've selected. It's most of the major American cities, plus a bunch of the mid-sized cities. And there you see the the homicide rate spike uh, in looks like, you know, early-ish 2020. No, it's, um, it's June of 2020. It's late May and June. Um, but, I mean, it's immediately following um, the George Floyd protests. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I when I look at, at this particular graph, it looks to me like it starts a little bit before that. But Well, um, it, it goes up. Accelerated. Yeah. But keep in mind, there, there's always sort of the seasonal variations um, where crime yeah. will be at its lowest. So some of that you would just expect. Um, and then you have, I mean, and you know, COVID did happen. So, And then, you know, the, this, this breaks down the different types of offenses that have uh, gone up over, you know, between 2020 and 2023. Um, again, homicide uh, was 40% higher in the first half of 2021 than in the first half of 2019. Some areas that where things seem to go down were like burglary, robbery, um, and then a really big spike just this year in uh, motor vehicle theft. Um, so could you just pick apart a little bit of all of that for us? Like, first of all, let's start with the homicide spike. Why in particular would homicide just go up that that that's what kind of scared the crap out of everybody in 2020 2021 and it was a huge and very quick increase i mean it was the largest increase i think we've ever seen in america during that time um and that does again though it it, it tends to be in neighborhoods that already had some shootings suddenly had double and triple the number of shootings mm -hmm. um and some neighborhoods that had few had a little more and many places had no shootings before or after um the other crimes i mean i keep in mind that all this is reported crime um and some of it is directly related to police doing less every time police make an arrest um it's a reported crime so if police aren't being proactive um the crime rate will go down but that doesn't mean necessarily that the crimes aren't happening um and then you also i mean covid was a a, a wild card in there and that sort of changed burglary rates and so on but i think a lot i mean i trust shooting numbers, I trust murder numbers, I trust car theft numbers, because those are relatively accurately recorded. Um, the other crimes, a lot of, I mean, even in the best of times, you know, roughly half of them aren't reported. And, and there's no reason to think that number, that percentage didn't change drastically in 2020. So partly, I just don't like using those other figures, because I don't think they're reliable data. Um, but why are so few of them reported? Uh, people either, you know, they're busy, they're going to work, they, 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 you know, they don't want to bother waiting around because it'll take, you know, half their day and, and also potentially get involved in the, in the criminal justice system, criminal justice system, even if just as a victim or a witness, but the obligations can stack up on that in terms of, um, going to court and whatnot. Um, some of it is they don't want to talk to police. Um, some of it is they believe sometimes correctly that it's, you know, police aren't going to, well, what's it matter? Um, the crimes already happened. What are police going to do? They're, they're not going to solve it. And even if they do, it probably won't help you, you know, fix the door that somebody busted on your house 
Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons people don't report crime. Um, but again, partly because of, of COVID, I think that non-reporting went up um, in 2020. Hmm. What's going on with the, uh, do you have any insight on what's going on with the vehicle theft? Um, well, I think it's a combination of things. Some of it is, you know, it was discovered that these certain types of vehicles like Kia's are really easy to steal. Yeah. Um, so that became, I mean, it became a trend of fashion. Um, I think that's Thanks a, a TikTok. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, there, I mean, there were some, there were some cities that I, I believe San Francisco was actually trying to sue Kia, uh, because they said they made their cars too easy to steal and therefore put an undue burden on their police department, which seems a little ridiculous, but, um, so, but, but you think that actually accounts for a lot of it is a lot of it. Um, ease of stealing. It, yeah. it does. It's also, I mean, it does depend on policy and policing at a local level in the sense that if you tell police that they can't pursue stolen cars, um, they get away. Um, I mean, there's a risk, of course, to pursuing stolen cars, uh, which is traffic crashes and deaths. Um, but when word gets out that there's no consequence for stealing a car, so even and part of it is police were pursuing less. Part of it is that if they did catch criminals, they were released. Um, either release pending trial or charges were dropped, but there's a huge difference between somebody who gets caught, you know, which isn't that likely, first of all, but if they get caught, do they spend the night in jail? Um, that can have a deterrent effect because it's not pleasant. If the alternative is you get a desk appearance ticket or some equivalent and get to go back home and get to party with your friends and tell them about your crazy adventures, um, that, you know, th that does send a message that, okay, I guess, this is okay. There's, they're really, so, I mean, this is basic deterrence theory and we seem to have forgotten that at some level, um, that you can impact people's behavior through us. I mean, I'm not talking locking up somebody for life. I'm just really talking about arresting them and having them go to jail. Um, a lot of cities have stopped that in the name of, well, in the name of various things, decarceration, equity, progressive prosecution. Um, you can't put your finger on any single one of these and say that's why, but collectively these things certainly matter. Let's wait. So are there examples of deliberate policies to linger on the car theft example for a second that discourage arresting or incarcerating someone for stealing a car? Cause that's a pretty high level felony. Um, I've, I've heard some of the progressive prosecutors. I remember talking to George Gascon about this one time and he said that, uh, some of the cops when he was in uh, San Francisco sort of spitefully took a hands off approach once he got in. And that's where he was placing the blame. But um, are there actual policies that are discouraging police officers from pursuing stolen car crimes? Car theft? Uh, well, no pursued policy is a part of that. But that, of course, isn't universal. That depends on the city. Um, but. I don't want to let these prosecutors off the hook. I mean, Gascon may have been right, um, but it's not that the police were doing this necessarily without cause. If you arrest somebody first, I mean, there's a risk to that. Um, you could get hurt. Uh, there could be a viral video. Um, you don't get in trouble for not working as a cop. Um, so every time you do, I mean, there's a decision should, is this worth it? And if you do put yourself at risk and you do make a good arrest and then the charges aren't pressed or prosecuted, you kind of go, well, what's the point? Why did I put myself out for this when it doesn't happen, when there's, when the, when the, when the system breaks down post-arrest? I mean, right now in DC, and I don't, um, you know, more than half the cases, I don't remember the exact number, but more than half of arrests aren't charged. Um, that of course has an impact on how police do their job. Um, you might say they're, you know, this is, they're taking, they're, they're doing what the prosecutor wants to some extent. And keep in mind that the prosecutor has an incredible amount of discretion and total immunity. So um, it's a very important job. But if the prosecutor decides that their primary focus is to reduce incarceration rather than prosecute criminals, um, the system breaks down. I mean, that's their job is, you know, it's an adversarial system and they're supposed to be the ones who are prosecuting criminals. There's a far cheaper version of the argument that you're making. I think you're making um, a much better argument, but the cheaper version goes like this. And we see this on Twitter, social media all the time. 
people essentially say whenever there's a high profile um, crime uh, and a viral video in any big city, New York, LA, DC, San Francisco, there's a whole bunch of people who respond with this chorus of, well, you voted for this, didn't you? Um, and what you're saying is almost like the good faith and far more rigorous version of you voted for this a little bit. Do you, what do you think of that sort of reaction that many people have? Is it, you know, sort of a half truth? Uh, is it something that's just totally counterproductive to talk about? Or is it useful to try to get people to understand the relationship between the prosecutors that they um, put in place versus and how that affects which crimes are actually um, gone after and the overall quality of life in their cities? Um, I, I mean, often the people who make that argument, I'm a little bit leery of, I don't know, sometimes it's too simplistic, but the basic I, concept is, yeah, elections have consequences. Um, these yeah. prosecutors are not silent about their goals. Um, when the Manhattan DA announced, you know, that he wasn't going to prosecute shoplifting, um, that has a, that matters. I mean, I often think there's a weird sense that criminals don't have agency. Um, they know very well what the policies are because they deal with the system. And you have, especially in democratic cities, these elections are determined in primary elections by and large. Voter turnout is incredibly low, which I think is you know, a greater problem for democracy in our country. But you get someone who says a certain platitudes that you want to hear um, and people go, oh, that sounds good. But they're, they're not. But yeah, they have consequences if prosecutors don't want to prosecute. Um, and we have to figure out what what our goals are. Um, and apparently people are voting for this. And then when it happens, they kind of go, oh, I didn't actually, you know, I didn't expect that. Well, then you have to put someone else in, in, in that in that office. Let me wanna... speak as someone who maybe uh, it would be in that category of like I people would say, like, I got what I deserve <laughs> as a voter. I was a, I was in California in the early 2010s when some of this stuff was on the ballot. I recall voting to and, you know, uh, rethink aspects of three strikes, for instance, where the uh, it would be like if the third strike was what they call, I think, a leaner then uh, they wouldn't necessarily incarcerate the person for 20, 25 years or whatever the third strike is supposed to be. Um, and then there was a there was a slew of them there. And the the famous, you know, nine hundred fifty dollar uh, anything below nine hundred fifty dollars uh, shoplifting would not be a felony. I, I don't think I voted for that one. But then there's like drug reforms. Um, I th there's some sense where I feel like some of those were a good idea. Like I still think that super long, you know, endless sentences aren't always the the great the right way to go, um, and that we need to rethink drug policy. But also, like shoplifting or stealing a car is a crime that needs to be prosecuted. Um, like if you had to drill down on like what you think are the most destructive one or two policies for like real law and order, like what would those be? Um, I, I'm not a fan of three strikes, but I might be a fan of 10 strikes. Um, at some point, when you have repeat offenders, I mean, you know, enough. Um, you know that someone with 12 felony convictions, if you release that person, um, even, you know, pending adjudication, they're going to go and do a 13th. I mean, that's what they do. So I don't, you know, necessarily have the solutions, but just sort of saying, well, crime is down nationwide, so it doesn't matter is not a moral or politically winning position. Um, some yeah. of it is also, look, shop, it's not like shoplifters were always prosecuted, you know, before 2020. Um, there is a resource limitation and you have to pick your battles. Um, but don't announce non-prosecution as a policy. You need the discretion to say, um, okay, maybe, you know, let's be realistic. We're not going to prosecute this person, whatever. It's not worth it. Um, but then you get someone who is a repeat violent offender. And if you get that person for shoplifting, uh, yeah, then you go after them for what you got. Um, so it's a sort of blanket statements of non-prosecution from prosecutors that I think is very troubling. Um, but then it, 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 you know, it combines with changes in state. Here's the thing. There have been hundreds of different laws and elections um, and changes in policy over the past decade in policing and the criminal justice system. And I can't think of a single one that would be considered getting tougher on crime. Um, 
I'm not against a lot of these reforms. Some of them are often, there's part of it that's good. And then uh, like, there's a hidden part that actually is, you know, poison pill and disaster. Well, it's not a poison pill. It's just a disastrous part of the policy. Yeah. Um, but when you collectively, you have, you know, you've passed hundreds of laws um, that make it tougher to prosecute or police um, cities. Yeah, collectively, they have an impact. And they keep saying, well, you can't, you know, it's not this one. Okay, maybe it's not that one. But some, you know, overall, tell me how, how you know, it's it's just, it, it's chipping away constantly. There's a, a motivation that I think a lot of people don't realize, um, which isn't to improve policy. It's to, um, it's, it's, it's driven by a ideology that wants to abolish police and prison. Um, and so anything that sort of moves in that direction, they can, you know, it, they can support and then individually, you know, they'll give it a nice name and there might be a good part of it too. Like with bail, bail reform in, in New York city or New York state, um, was not all bad, but parts of it were horrible. Um, you know, they passed a law that every cop in New York city knows and nobody else does. And it was called the chokehold ban. This is the city council. Um, well, chokeholds were already illegal in the state. So that part was completely redundant. And then they threw in this part about putting pressure on the diaphragm and they made that in the course of an arrest. Um, and they made that a crime and it only applies to police officers. Well, that also makes police worry. Well, you mean every time I arrest someone who's resisting, um, potentially I have could be prosecuted for that. Um, and they say, well, you know, we won't really, well, they tried to they say, well, we won't really do that. Well, they might, you know, wait, wait for the right video. And then when there was a move to sort of change that absurd, absurd part, and they like, oh, we didn't, you know, the mayor de Blasio at the time was saying, oh, we can change that later. And the people in city council said, no, you can't. We wrote it exactly as we wanted. Um, so that abolition movement um, is dangerous to public safety. Um, it's inequitable in, in who it affects in terms of criminal victimization. Um, so there does have to be some political pushback. And I think we're starting to see that finally. Um, but it's a lot harder to, you know, put the house back together after you've broken it. But how, how, big is that contingent really? I mean, we see some of the loudest voices in that movement, in the, you know, police abolitionism, in the prison abolitionist movement. You know, we see these loud voices amplified, but the vast majority of normal people, when you actually pull them, they don't want that, right? Like, isn't this just something that those of us who spend a lot of time on Twitter or are in the media class um, give sort of undue air airtime to? Or is this like a real phenomenon that's actually majorly affecting the types of prosecutors that get put into office and the, you know, political wins? In some, yeah, most of the public, if you give them these individual things, they go, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but in some cities, it is uh, that whatever percent wants that, they often control city council. Mm -hmm. um, and people continue to vote for them because they're progressive. And they think that's, that's the right thing to do, or, or maybe they actually want this. But I mean, New York City Council just passed a horrible law and it they overrode Mayor Adams' veto that says that cops have to document every time um, they interact with the public in any matter that concerns any crime. Um, it will be literally impossible. Um, this means like if there's a shooting on the subway um, and they go in and say, did anyone see anything or whatever, you know, they would now have to dock you. There were a hundred people in that subway car. Now they have to fill out a hundred forms. Um, is that, is that so really? Yeah. Um, it's, it's in to... New York state. It's called the level one stop, which is not a stop in the legal sense. Oh. It's not a stop based on reasonable suspicion. Um, it is an interaction. Um, oh. And that's what the law does. Um, it, it goes into effect in the summer. I mean, it can't be followed. Um, so, it will be Seems curious like to see a what way happens. To streamline that. I mean, co cops now have body cams. Every interaction can be documented that way. Like, w wouldn't a better way to do that just be like, hey, you can, if you had an interaction with a police officer, you can easily request the body cam footage of that interaction. Or Of course, but like I think that. you're missing the point, which is it's not really about that. It is about, it's trying to stop policing. And this is yet another way they can do that. Hmm. Um, I mean, and also there, you know, as a witness, you, he went that way. Uh, but do you want, I mean, I don't want to be documented. Um, there's a risk to that. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I no longer believe these laws are passed in good faith is the problem. Um, they have a goal and they're, you know, so they're succeeding, but this is, this is, 
Yeah, I don't. It's nothing else. It'll be a big lawsuit against the police department, but they've passed a law that cannot be followed. Um, That's wild. And they overrode a veto of it. So they they do have political power. Um, hmm. That honestly convinces me to a far greater degree than I had been, uh, though it does make me way more depressed than I was before. So thanks a lot, Peter. Um, well, the other thing I should point out about that law is actual stops in the legal sense of the most of the country understands it stops based on reasonable suspicion where you stop being where you can't leave or don't feel free to leave. That's that's the, what a police stop is. Those are already documented. So we didn't need the law for that. The only purpose of the law was to get that interaction part. Um, so, yeah, I want to take us. For. I want to take us into the thing that you were referencing, which is that last week there was um, a whole pretty horrifying shooting on the A train. Um, Zach, I think you have the video of that. So if we could just I roll do, that. and I'm going to just roll a little bit of it. Um, it's an edited version, and I'm going to narrate a little bit of it for our listening audience who is not um, watching the video. Um, this happened in the middle of the day or, you know, late in the afternoon, 4.45 p.m. Uh, you see a man with a yellow hat there who uh, is confronting someone who's sitting down, getting up in his face. Um, everyone's kind of just passively sitting by. Uh, he's escalating. The guy is challenging, is standing up and, you know, they're taking off their jackets, getting ready to do fisticuffs here. Everyone's clearing out. The other side of the car, and now they're putting hands on each other. Um, he's got him. Uh, the assailants has got the other guy pinned and throwing big haymakers. Uh, and he just got stabbed there. That woman yeah. got stabbed. Uh, someone has intervened to try to break them apart. This guy uh, deserves some credit. Yeah, for sure. And now he's. Uh, you know, they're apart, but he's searching through his bag for what will turn out to be a gun. Um, everyone sees that he now has a gun and is approaching, and everyone's panicking, trying to get out. Uh, you'll hear the gunshots uh, ring out in a minute as they... Luckily, uh, they were right near a stop as he started shooting. Everyone's scrambling to get out. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Uh, just Let me a out! terrifying situation to imagine being in. Um, there's a baby on there. You can hear the gunshot. There we go. Um, and yeah, I, I got to ask Liz first because I know you ride the train. Um, you know, what was your reaction to first seeing the story? Well, I mean, this happened at 4.45 p.m. This happened on a weekday, right before rush hour. I, you know, I live in Rockaway in Queens. I'm on the A train. This is um, the A stop in downtown Brooklyn, which I take all the time with my kid to get to our friends' houses. Um, this is a highly traffic stop. It's a pretty horrifying situation. And the thing that I keep coming back to, and I want to turn this over to Peter, is what, if anything, do these high profile crimes tell us? And also the, the other thing that I keep grappling with is I think literally the week before this, you know, Governor Hochul announced an initiative to deploy, I think, a thousand total National Guardsmen and state police officers to start doing random bag checks um, for commuters of the subway system and, um, you know, more police to patrol the stations. And the thing I just keep coming back to is you know, if we're stopping one in every 10 commuters to search their bags, and in fact, this gun was in a pocket, I mean, what would this initiative actually have done to stop this type of crime from happening? And is there a way to restore some sense of public trust that riding the A train with your kid in the middle of the day will be safe again? Um, first, I want to talk about those National Guards. Uh, national. Um, that is political theater. Yeah. Um, that they're at Grand Central. Um, it's so the governor can say she did something and <clears throat> perhaps can reassure suburban commuters. Um, it It's show. Um, and there's also a dynamic between, I just to point out to non-New Yorkers who might be listening in and also to Zach, it's also a little bit of stunt uh, between Governor Hochul and Mayor Eric Adams, right? Because Adams has also been trying to 
uh, do this type of thing. And so it's a little bit of this like one upping game to try to, you know, there's always been tension between the governor's office and the mayor's office. And so it's an opportunity for both of them to sort of posture as the one actually fixing the problem. I'm curious yeah. why you say that it's theater, because, um, you know, the New Yorkers who watch that video, I'm sure they're just thinking, well, I don't want a gun smuggled onto my train. So what else are you going to do except try to screen every bag that goes through? So wh wh why are you saying that it's theater? Um, partly, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Um, part, partly because they're national guards, they're not police. Um, mm. they don't have police powers. They can't stop or arrest somebody. Um, so that's part of the problem. Um, soldiers are not cops. Uh, but we can't, I mean, it is important to keep guns off the subway and off the streets. Um, and we did that in the past and that's part of like, we have lessons from the past, um, that we seem to have forgotten. Um, the number of murders on the subway um, not too long ago were zero in a year. Um, and there were three or fewer um, for roughly a decade. And then we stopped um, policing subway rules um, and murders went up from two to four to six, not six, eight. Now they're in the double digits. Um, I think there were five last year. It did go down last year. Uh, yeah, but of course, I've got the data here from M So this is a, a visualization that you created based on MTA data that goes up to 2022. And yes, as you see, it goes up. I was going to say, that looks familiar. At 10 uh, last year. <laughs> and uh, our audience, yeah, we, uh, regular year, listening. Year, 10 and 2020. Yeah, our regular listening audience knows that we always post the links to all these uh, sources. So you can look for that in the description. And then uh, this is the actual MTA data. And as you were mentioning, 2023, it dropped down to five murders instead of 10. Um, these are, you know, relatively low numbers for a huge city like New York. But uh, I mean, there but should be no be murders zero. on a subway, you know, um, you could have well, zero and felony and assaults, 570 felony assaults in 2023, up from 556. So and these are thing, within you know, the subway. On there. Yeah. And this, this is within the subway system itself, right, Zach? Yes. OK, this so I just, think that. Uh, that yeah. Yeah, that's the important thing, you know, to keep in mind here. I mean, 12 rapes happening on the subway, you know, on the subway trains over the course of 2022. You know, is not, not to be just like stereotypical helpful. libertarian about this, but like if this was a privately run train, like that would be shut down if there were 10 murders on it. Uh, so there's I mean, something so going wrong. Here. You know, it is million, literally millions of people ride the subway every day. Um, so you know, I, there, there, there is the perspective that I ride the subway and it's, you know, I, I expect to get where I'm going safely. Mm -hmm. And I, so far I have, um, but there is, the subway has a special significance to New Yorkers because generally we're forced to ride it. Um, so we don't have a choice. And when something happens on the A train, you, you know, even though it happened miles from where you live, um, you feel that you have a certain sort of possessiveness or even pride like that's my train yeah so it it it, it has that this could it have happened to me. you it spooks you in a way i literally yeah. had friends who get off at my stop and then this is their stop and they were on this line like a few hours before this happened like it's like that type of thing where it's just like oh my god that could have been the car with my buddies coming back from my house in it i mean and that's it's not that's just the shootings um you know it is indicative of general um greater disorder and crimes on the subway um, and that's part of the problem. And this could be policed. I mean, that guy who who got shot with his own gun in the end, um, you know, of course he didn't pay his fare because criminals, as like some point of pride, simply can't, um, you know, pay their fare and go through the turnstile. I mean, there are videos of people, which I find amusing. I just remember one guy who was jumping the turnstile, leaving the subway. It was just, it was so <laughs> ingrained. Um which for non-New Yorkers, again, you don't have to pay an exit fare. You don't have to swipe again. You literally just go out the door. Like yeah. it's not like DC or other systems where you swipe in and you swipe out. New York, you just do it upon entry. Um, so, and that, so that idea that you're that idea you're talking about there that uh, you know if there was more enforcement of the lower level stuff that it would stop it would prevent uh, so, some of these higher level incidents from unfolding. Um, I noticed on your blog this really interesting graph that kind of maps out that correlation. So the blue line here is citations issued, uh, and as that goes down, um, shooting incidents 
go up. This is NYC shooting incidents, um, 2017, June, June, July, 2017, 18 through June, July, uh, 21, 22. Um, so is that what you're getting at with when you say that, you know, there needs to be a return to a different kind of policing that this is like, it's like Bill Bratton 2.0. Like we need to really be doing broken windows style. Like nothing, nothing slips by. No, because nothing slips by is zero tolerance. Um, it has okay. to be intelligently used. Um, when Bratton did reduce robberies on the subway, um, this is now we're talking back in 1991 when he was the police chief of the New York City Transit Police Department, which is now merged with the NYPD. Um, he did implement a broken windows approach. Um, and with his right hand man, Jack Maple, they noticed that when they did catch criminals, they all, the vast majority lived by, I think it was seven subway stops. So they focused on those seven subway stops. Um, and they arrested turnstile jumpers, which now, by the way, has been decriminalized. So now it's just a violation. Yet another one of those things chipping away at, at police tools. Um, but even to their surprise, by um, arresting turnstile jumpers, felony crimes on the subway dropped immediately and substantially. So it's, partly it's because the actual criminals were being detained, but partly it was the sense of just someone's in charge here. Um, it is not a free-for-all. People behave differently in different environments, and it's about changing behavior. Um, but so it's no, it's not just about cracking down on everyone and getting stats for stats sake, you have to figure out what the problem is, um, who's doing it. But broken windows was very much used um, as a way to, um, it was a net to some extent, but it was a way to actually target specific individuals. Um, it turns out that a lot of people jumping turnstiles were wanted on a warrant of significant percentage had weapons on them. Um, so suddenly people were less likely to carry weapons because they thought, well, I might get stopped. Um, so in a, in a sense, the subway in mass was de was de-escalated in the 90s. And it's interesting because it was before the great crime drop in the city. Um, and it was a great natural experiment because robberies were down in the subway and not on the streets above. Um, so it's a very good indicator that was what was happening on the subway actually um, was mattered. It wasn't just luck. It wasn't just some greater trend that affected everybody. Is this too high? Oh, Zach, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, you know, one thing that jumped out to me when I was looking at this is, you know, further down in that same post, you go into, well, what are some of these citations? Um, and you can look at some of the summons. A lot of them is are things that I would completely agree should not be tolerated in a public space, whether that's public urination or uh, fighting, um, reckless driving, you know, um, trespassing but then there's there's things like motorcycle helmet required unlicensed street vending unlawful consumption of alcohol like open container uh, law cannabis. violations right yeah so i mean for me it's like Can what i, I worry about? about yeah well let me just say one thing first which is what, what i worry about is that um if the like once the conversation turns to, you know, we really need to ramp up enforcement on the minor violations. There are a lot of minor violations that I think are unjust and that uh, and counterproductive to to enforce. And it it seems like it seems very difficult to have that nuanced conversation at the policy level. And it, it always becomes like you have to, you know, have I know you're not advocating zero tolerance, but that seems to be how it it often shakes out. It's like zero tolerance, or uh, we're going to like let people pee wherever they want to in in public. Like, what what um, do you think are are the most like? What are some of the areas where you think um, you know maybe the police shouldn't be focusing that much resources there, and they should be focusing it here instead. The, the key is not to focus on the specific minor violations we're talking about. These are tools that we give cops to make legal stops. Um, of, the, of the three you highlighted there, the you know motorcycle without a helmet, um, <clears throat> which I didn't include in my chart, but that's an interesting one because if you have a gang of 
motorbikes going down the road, doing wheelies, going against traffic, um, people j making a lot of noise, uh, people on sidewalks. People generally don't like that. Okay, but you need something to actually, you need a crime. Um, so that's what they, I assume that's what they used. It's not that they're saying this is really the greatest, it's not the problem necessarily is that people aren't, motorcyclists aren't wearing helmets. It's the problem is the motorcyclists and we need something to get them on. Um, that's what that's these right. minor offenses are be for. Another, wouldn't there be another crime to get them on if they're, you know, violating speed limits or unsafe driving? Like why, why do you need the pre, all these pretense? Of you need something that isn't subjective. Uh -huh. Um, speeding, you could see, you know, you're not, you don't have a radar camera. Um, unsafe driving is you have to describe it and the you know the judge won't generally buy it um not having helmet is a yes or no situation you can't i mean you either do or you don't um so that's a great one because it's not a very subjective uh, interpretation of the law um open container again sh this is this is the thing it should be selectively enforced um because mm -hmm. the problem isn't necessarily somebody with an open container um and you always get the thing well you know people in central park um you know, listening to a concert or drinking wine. Yeah, but they're not shooting each other. Um, there was another recent it, it shooting in New, in New York where a 19-year-old woman was killed in a bodega after a guy was hitting on her. Um, mm. I can almost guarantee he had an open container before um, he killed that woman. Um, this is a block where someone was murdered at the bodega last year. So that is where police should be focused on that block because of the violence there. Um, and presumably this guy was harassing women all night. I don't, you know, I, I don't know. No, Maybe he was the, at home I mean, reading a the, book. The thing the that worries me though, problem. Peter, is that like, um, there's the, there's the predatory version of that. Like the kind of the worst example that we've seen in recent years is like what was going on in Ferguson, Missouri before the killing of Michael Brown. And there was that huge reaction to that and some uh, you know the the narrative of what happened to Nike, michael brown ended up not being correct but um there was a lot of a lot of the reason there was anger in ferguson seemed to be because they had this predatory policing system where they were just like milking these people for with fees and fines and getting them caught up in long, uh, you know, going to the courthouse all the time to deal with that. And like the, the amount of revenue they were taking in uh, from Ferguson was like twice some of the surrounding cities fr just from fees and fines. Um, so it was, it was truly like, outrageous. Uh, yeah, very outrageous. And so I, I know that's not the situation in New York and we would never want it to become that. How do you avoid that that outcome? Um, you know, if if you want to uh, do broken windows policing, how do you avoid it becoming predatory and like parasitic? Or, or on how do you avoid it becoming people? the stop question and frisk fiasco that we did have in New York City, right? Um, which happened later. That was in the two thousands. Um, good leadership, and of course, that's easier said than done. Um, somewhat of accountability. We collectively did not know what was going on in for well, we never heard of Ferguson. But um, we did not know what was going on in Ferguson. I'm in this, you know, field professionally. Um, I was shocked, uh, really shocked my conscience, that report about what they were doing in terms of pedestrian stops and revenue that the city was being funded on fines and court fees and that. And that. Um, so that has to stop. But that does not relate to that 19 year old woman being killed in a Brooklyn bodega. Um, mm. And part of the problem is there's an outrage somewhere. And then we sort of, you know, then we say, well, we can't have policing anywhere. Um, what the NYPD did in the nineties in terms of their crime reduction was outstanding and arrests did go up. Um, a little known fact is arrests went up far less in the 1990s than they went up in the 1980s under Dinkins and community policing. Um, I mean, we either, you know, we either want policing or we don't. Now that said, we want good policing and we want it targeted, but yeah, but we do need, um, discretionary policing. And if you're going to prevent a, a murder, you have to stop someone before they murder somebody on a lesser crime. Um, now, there still is a crime. So not that everyone who gets stopped is a murderer, but well, you know, you could also not commit that crime and you won't be stopped. But that block in <clears throat> that block in Brooklyn um, is a pot spot. Um, so yeah, there, you know, you need to enforce open container laws there. Um, you need to, just like saying someone's in control of the subway, you need to say someone's in control of these streets. Um, I, I know it's, I mean, it's not a very good libertarian position, but rule of law is a good thing. And that's a radical statement these days. I get what you're saying, but I do struggle, for the record, but yeah, I struggle with this tension though, so much as a libertarian and, and you know, this, we've talked about this before, Peter, 
but where I feel this strong tension, like it's actually a really, really good political shift that has happened over definitely my sort of um, political lifetime, uh, the time that I've been paying attention to politics, this sense of people really beginning to pick up the libertarian talking point and this deep philosophical value that libertarians have of trying to distinguish between victimless crimes and crimes where there is a discernible victim, right? And so when I look at the list, like what Zach just pulled up on the screen, and I see things like, you know, hearing a muffler noise um, from far enough from, from a certain distance away, or open container violations are another good example. And then I contrast that with- mufflers, I wish they would enforce that more. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. mufflers, that's the problem, but, it's the tailpipes. But so, but so there's like those categories of crimes, and then there's turnstile hopping, right? And I see these things as fundamentally different because with, you know, I, I suppose you could argue the fair evasion thing, but at least with that, there's, there's really this sense of, well, wait a second, you know, you have to pay for the service that you are using, right? And if we want our city to function properly and we want to ensure that the budget doesn't um, get totally screwed up, it's important for people to pay their fares. We're already majorly subsidized. Uh, so our fares are way cheaper than what they would be if we were actually forced to bear the true cost of the subway system. But I, I struggle a little bit with this idea of like, I struggle, I struggle a little bit with this idea of like, will New York City be turned into Singapore uh, if we crack down on all of these more minor things? And isn't it actually a really, really good thing for libertarians and non-libertarians alike that we distinguish between, okay, which crimes have an actual big impact where other people are harmed versus which ones are just true individual freedom things. And we should just let people play their damn loud music if we want to. How do you look at this? Like, do you think that it's a good thing that people are sort of grogging this idea of the victimless crime and and trying to roll back the degree to which we've cracked down on this? Or do you just see it as like totally a proxy, totally a, a thing in a in a cop's toolkit that's really important to preserve? Well, if, if it's related to a major crime, then it's a tool in the, in the cop's toolkit. But I mean, if my neighbor is playing loud music at 4 a.m., I'd want him to stop. And if, if I ask him and he doesn't, this is like the idea that you live in a city, so you have to deal with drug dealers blasting music in a car outside your apartment. Um, no, uh, we don't have to put up with that. I mean, these these are choices. And of course, some people will, you know, what is acceptable behavior is there's a huge gray area in how that's defined. Um, but I'm no, I'm not against better quality of life in the neighborhood that I live in. But, but can I, like, here's a true victim yeah. of this crime mm -hmm. um, is, you know, drug addicts shooting up in public. Um, yeah. I would, I don't like want that. That's my, yeah. that's my bourgeois, um, you know, entitled position. And we didn't used to have that. And then we made a political choice and we legalized it by the legalization of needles. And we took that, the enforcement mechanism out of police because that's what they were using. And now we have people shooting up in public. So I think it's declined a bit recently. Um, I mean, I don't know. Do you have a problem with people shooting up heroin well, in a yeah, park? The, the, I, I mean, I, Go ahead, Liz. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. And I, I, I think it's you're an interesting person to talk to in particular because I think I I feel very conflicted on these questions, right? On one hand, as a like I think open container violations, okay, maybe that's the best possible example where it's like, you know what? It really doesn't particularly bother me if somebody has their little paper bag and their, you know, can of beer and they're just doing their thing and they're a little bit of a drunkard, but you know what? Like as long as they're not behaving in a threatening manner toward me or, or going to assault me or my kid, like, you know what, do your thing on the, on the stoop. Like, I don't give a shit, but it is, it is difficult though, because these other things that we're talking about, like somebody shooting up, there are tons of awful externalities that could stem from that, which legitimately makes a city less livable, right? Like I think about my toddler playing at the playground and the fact that there being, um, you know, needles in a given place, which I don't know whether uh, heroin addicts are always the best at sanitation practices and ensuring their needles are properly disposed of. Okay, well, that actually has a very real effect on the ability of like families to enjoy these public spaces. And damn it, I'm a taxpayer. And so I do feel like I have some right to these public spaces and to having them be reasonable. And even the needles thing aside, there's also this question of, you know, er sometimes erratic people or, you um, there's something very, I think, I don't know how to factor this into my little libertarian brain, this idea that we are taxpayers who deserve high quality public spaces. And when you have erratic people or when you have people who just truly are in a state of extraordinary despair and need slumped over in public spaces, making it so it's hard to pass through the turnstile because they're passed out in front of it, which was a situation I actually encountered in Brooklyn on the G. There's something awful about that. And I, I find that to be 
I don't exactly know what to do there. I don't exactly know what type of policy to support because on one hand, you could conceivably make the case that that's a victimless crime. On the other hand, isn't the user, the addict, aren't they the victim, right? Like it seems well, like a really bad state of affairs. And I'm curious about how you square that. A good way to look at it um, is, the con is if somebody is claiming and controlling public space, um, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, that, that is a broken window. Um, it's just one litmus test you can use. You know, if that person is in the park, therefore nobody else can use it, um, then it's a problem. Um, part of me just goes, this isn't about theory. Um, it's not about, I, I don't know. I, I, I always want to focus more on the nitty gritty and think of people who have to live through these. Um, and we, I mean, I really mean you and me right now. Um, you know, we, uh, have to deal with these problems less than a lot of pe other people in New York, yeah. where these quality of life issues are far greater. Um, and I think there's a unfortunate tendency to sort of say, well, I don't think this, you know, talk about state power and so on. But I mean, um, other people don't give a damn about there and they're just trying to get their kids to school and go to work and don't want to have to deal with erratic and potentially um, violent people. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it is kind of that simple. Um, and I, I don't like getting distracted in a way by the by the theoretical concerns. Not that, you know, we should never think about them. But no, someone should not. I mean, look, the subway, in some ways, is the easiest place to police because you can eject people from the system. Mm -hmm. That's a power that police on the street don't have. You can do a lot on the sidewalk that you're not permitted to do in the subway. Um, so I don't know what the answer is for drug addiction or homelessness or housing policy. Um, and to be a big glib, I don't care. I mean, I do care at some level. But in ter as a subway rider, I don't care. Um, whatever you're doing, you can't do it here. You've made this point a few times that I, I found it. It's been really formative to how I look at the, the subway system and this policy question specifically. But this idea of like, it's a deliberate policy choice to turn subways into de facto homeless shelters, which is what they are in New York right now. And we can ask questions about what is fair to the actual homeless people in question, but we're also kind of sidestepping the question of what is fair to the commuters? What is fair to the subway riders? Do they have a claim to this thing that they are paying for? And I think you come down in this place of like, the answer is yes, we do have a claim to that. And that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind, which for whatever reason keeps getting shunted aside by a lot of really progressive New Yorkers. And that's, that's been a very formative thing in changing how I look at this question. And we already draw the line somewhere. Um, you're not, a, you know, we don't let yeah. people camp in Central Park. Um, oh, well, but but Tompkins Square Park is okay. Like, I don't, you know, it, it, this, it, we have to draw the line somewhere. And I would like to draw that line outside the subway system as a subway rider. I think that's very important. Um, but we already have these lines. Um, and again, they're choices. Um, it, it, the subway system went through this exact same problem um, and issues and solutions in the 90s. And then we just sort of gave it up because I don't know. Um, and, you know, it's not, you can defend um, a better subway environment. I mean, I think primarily people do forget about the subway riders. I think that really isn't incredibly important, um, but it's not good for people. It's not good, good for the people who live. These people need help who are on the subway. I mean, yeah. yeah, sometimes they're just someone down on their luck, but I mean, you and I have both seen people like this. It's we've trained, our city to yeah, walk over, like, is that person dead? I don't know. Well, yeah. I'm just going to walk by because I'm going to work. Um, it is not a healthy environment. Um, they are victimized. They, you know, hypothermia, electrocution. Um, the idea that they should be de facto homeless shelters so that the problem isn't swept under the rug you hear. So um, some advocates want that in our face. So then they can advocate for money for their nonprofit service providing organizations. Um, no, I, I mean, I would like the problem solved. I That's not my professional forte. Uh, in the meantime, I do kind of want it swept under the rug, for lack of a better term. Um, we shouldn't have to put up with that. But morally, it's also the right thing to do for the people um, who desperately need help. I, I do want to ask you to return to the question Liz raised earlier, The this, this called the Singapore question, because I agree with you that any space, whether it's publicly or privately managed, is going to have rules. Um, it's just kind of crazy to think that anything would be able to go in the subway or a park where children are playing. Um, but then are there models of 
governance or cities that you look at, um, I, I would put, I, we raised Singapore because that's kind of like the far end of the spectrum of like extreme law and order, like famous for, you know, flogging people for spitting gum on the ground and so forth. Um, and then there's a whole range of, uh, you know, other most, a lot of other East Asian cities that are, you know, not quite Singapore. There's European approaches where there's more permissiveness uh, in certain realms like drug use, but maybe not in public spaces. Like, wh what do you, is there anything that you look at as a good model? Um, yeah, a lot of European cities do get it right. And it, it can be more permissive, but it's also more heavily policed um, because there are rules. Uh, and the punishments aren't as severe, but there are punishments. Um, but, you know, I would just simply go back to New York in 2017, 2018. Um, everything was trending in the right direction. Murders were below 300. Um, quality of life on the subway was high. Um, arrests were down. Incarceration was down. Everything was trending right. And then a cop murdered a man in Minnesota, and we decided the whole system was broken. Um, you know, it's this isn't, you know, Singapore is an extreme example. Um, and it, it's not, not going to happen here. I think it shouldn't happen here. Um, but things were pretty good in New York not that long ago. We could just go back to that. Um, but that would require, you know, the laws and the policing that we had then. Um, but everything was going, everything was going kind of well. I mean, I won't say everything because still people were being killed and people are suffering out there. Um, but it wasn't magic that did it. It was hard work. Um, it was choices we make. So, I don't dream of a utopia. I just want things as good as they can be. And as of now, you know, probably 2017 or so was the was the ideal year in New York. Um, we could go back to that. Hmm. Is there, um, you know, when you look at the the long history of crime, both in the U.S. and in New York City, um, obviously we're nowhere near the peak. Here's just the federal crime data. I know you don't like looking at national crime data, but... Oh, I do. Um, I like looking at it too. Don't worry. <laughs> it's the similar, lesson similar, it. similar story um, in New York. Um, like how... Uh, you, you say you want to go back to 2017. It's like, how, how far off is New York from 2017? Because it it's definitely not the most violent city in, in America. I'm speaking as a non-New Yorker, so I have no skin in the game here, but like, what are, um, like, what is, what are the, the specific things that, that you feel like have experienced the most like measurable decline that, that you're looking to see reversed back to 2016, 2017 era? I, I, uh, People in black and Hispanic men getting murdered, I think, is a big one. Um, yeah. I mean, that sort of trumps everything. It does trump my discomfort on the subway. Uh, you know, the, the, that shootings doubled in certain neighborhoods is is a moral imperative. Um, I think that always has to be saving lives, um, always has to be number one on the list. But, you know, luckily it's a big city with a lot of resources that we can do. Um, we can do more things, um, you know, simultaneous things. Uh, so we can focus on all these factors, but I think violence um, and shootings always has to be the, the, the main focus. Um, one thing I do want to bring us to though, because Peter, I know you have been a defender of this in the past is why should we bring back flogging? And are you at all worried about whether or not the Lee Kuan Yew Singapore vibe is appropriate for American cities. No, but you 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 have sort of made this sort of counterintuitive case um, in defense of a book about it. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a book about. It. I prefer to focus on my next book back from the <laughs> brink about the crime drop in New York. But um, in defense of flogging, I'm um, got a lot of press. Didn't sell anything. Um, it it was a more. I mean, it was a discussion about prisons, um, and I yeah. use floggings to focus on incarceration and the concept of punishment and what is acceptable punishment. And the gambit of the book was we don't whip people in America anymore because of our racist legacy, because it's cruel, because it's vicious. Um, but if you gave people the choice between getting flogged Singapore style and released or going to prison for a number of years, almost everyone would choose 
the lash over years of incarceration. Um, but we can, so flogging we don't do because it's immoral and, and unconscionable. Instead, we do something worse. Um, that that's that's sort of the theme of the book is to focus on our, our sort of hypocrisy around crime and punishment. Um, but the key part of the book was saying that we do that punishment is an important part. It's not just about rehabilitation. Um, people who do wrong should be punished. And by punished, I don't mean flogging and I don't mean incarceration necessarily. Um, but the idea that crimes have consequences, um, it's not just about helping um, the criminal, though, if we can, that's desirable too. Uh, but punishment serves a purpose. And we've kind of gotten away from even talking about the value of um, proportional uh, punishment. Do you think, for I mean, deterrence? Um, you know, I, I uh, years ago, I interviewed Mark Kleiman, who, um, you know, outlined the idea that there's a trade off between the sever the length and severity of a sentence and what he calls swift and certain punishment. And so therefore, if we're locking people up for decades, um, we're, we're filling up our prisons where there, it's expensive, it's overtaxing the system. Whereas if you traded that with, you know, more regular enforcement, you know, you're, you're going to get caught almost every time and you're going to face some sort of punishment every single time. That's going to be way more effective as a deterrent than the current system, which is like, you're probably not going to get caught, but if you do, we're going to throw the book at you. Um, do you buy that basic calculus? Yeah. I mean, the, the tenets of deterrence go back to the caria and, you know, swift, certain and proportional punishment. Um, one of the things I do mention in, in defense of flogging is Canada, um, generally the sentence length is on average and it depends, but is uh, is half of what it is in America. Um, they seem to do okay in Canada. Um, the nominal benefit from locking someone up, you know, for 15 years, as opposed to, to eight is very small. Um, it's, it's certainly secondary to actually catching the person and, you know, pressing charges and, and convicting and locking them up at all. Um, so it is weird that we have this sort of almost fetish with long prison sentences. That said, America is a more violent country. So it depends on the crime. You know, if you have a repeat offender who murders someone, well, I, I don't think they should get out in five years. Uh, but those are sort of different. I mean, America will probably yeah. always have more incarceration because we have more, as long as we have more violence and we will because of gun laws and inequity and, and just maybe our culture. Um, but there is a much more, we could have a more rational approach to mm. courts and prosecution and, and, and punishment and incarceration. And that, that's of course what um, in defense of flogging was trying to sort of bring out that debate. Not to I be mean, all like, like yeah. well, not to uh, be so all what? hit splint about it, but do we even have a shared sense of proportionality as it pertains to crime anymore? It feels like there's we're increasingly fractured, and maybe this is just the circles that I'm plugged into, but it feels like we're so fractured to the point where there's a bunch of almost reactionary law and order types who see the current um, state of quality of life uh, in American cities and say, fuck no. And then there's a lot of the uh, progressive ACAB types who I think legitimately think that like, you know, stealing people's things is just not a big deal. And so do we even have a shared sense of what proportionality should even be? I mean, that seems like an incredibly difficult thing to get consensus on. Um, we don't. And that goes back to the importance of the rule of law. I mean, this is why we have laws is to impose a uniform sense of proportionality. I mean, the irony of sort of a lot of the progressive position is, um, you know, if you got rid of police and prisons, um, it's not going to be replaced by utopia. It's going to be replaced by people who are going to be in many ways a lot more severe. I mean, one of the things cops do, ironically, somewhat regularly is they protect criminals from the mob. Um, the public can be vicious. These, you know, oh, we're going to have a community get together. Well, my neighbor, um, you know, may want to beat the crap out of that criminal um, and not sit around some kumbaya table with restorative justice. Um, so we need the law also in some ways protects um, protects offenders from the from the you know, vicious whims of the public. I mean, it's quickly, it's funny how quickly we forget the Seattle Chaz or Chop um, experiment. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, no policing in an area and very quickly an unarmed black kid was murdered and the murderers still have never been caught. Like, no, we're not ready for that. Um, yeah. It would be nice if we were, I suppose, like but the, I don't know if we'll ever be rise of a warlord, basically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, someone, yeah, you're going to get warlords and gang. I mean, the community, <laughs> they, the phrase is often used favorably. First of all, I think it's a bad phrase. You know, I don't have it. My block is not a community. Um, I am not my neighbor's keeper. I don't want to be my neighbor's keeper. This is why I pay taxes. This is why we have the state. Um, but yeah, without policing, the, the alternative is often going to be far uh, more severe um, than the current system. Yeah. You know, when you were mentioning um, sort of bringing some rationality to this, um, I think about like what like what uh role does te is technology going to play in all this particularly surveillance technology where where you're kind of taking the human element out of it somewhat uh having a more purely rational approach to crime i mean that that does seem like the you want you eric know, adams robocop I, I don't know want, that Zach? I want the RoboCop, but uh, I will say these highly law and ordered societies that we were referencing before uh, rely he heavily on automated surveillance um, to implement that order. And uh, on one hand, that is terrifying to me. Like, I, I don't like the idea of ubiquitous government surveillance, obviously. On the other hand, um, you know, automating some aspects of policing, I can certainly see the appeal if a lot of the problematic um, incidents that we see, these high profile incidents seem to like they could have been avoided if like maybe it was just a automated camera or something issuing the ticket. Like what do you, how does automation and surveillance work into your vision of a better policed society? Um, it has, I mean, I'm worried too a little bit in some ways. I think it's sort of inevitable. Um, I hate to say Foucault was right, but he may be on this kind of concept of yeah. surveillance. Um, police can't and shouldn't be locked into the technology of, you know, today or yesterday. Um, so as the technology advances, um, there are going to be tools police are going to use. Um, again, these are choices. I mean, it's good. It would be nice to get out ahead of this. You know, what do we want police drones to do? Um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was almost, the concept was unfathomable and to many people dystopian, but it's inevitable. Um, and you know, we, they, they serve a purpose. So yeah. we have to be transparent about this. We have to have discussions about it. Um, but society changes, law enforcement is going to change along with that, but that's a bit different than, and a bit more complicated, uh, than the idea of, you know, cameras and automated enforcement. Um, Again, I don't like zero tolerance. I'm really not for automated enforcement. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the move behind that is usually, oh, because cops are racist, um, so cameras won't be. Um, and yet, if you put cameras where traffic crashes happen and pedestrians die, um, it's still going to have a racially disparate impact. Um, and then what do you do about people that with fake tags and so on? At some point, um, you do need cops making traffic stops. Um, Right. I mean, I think it would, uh, you know, even if there is a, a disparate outcome, it becomes a lot harder to argue that it's a disparate, that it's like, you know, purposely uh, racist or discriminatory against someone. And um, it, we were talking with uh, Coleman Hughes about this a little bit last week, where if you put that they did that in Chicago and there was that disparate outcome, but the upside was also that these communities where there were a lot of traffic fatalities, the traffic fatalities went down disproportionately helping that community. So there's, there's the double edged sword to it. And then also there's, you know, the thing that I always try to keep in mind with when we're talking about police surveillance is this idea that, you know, David Brin, uh, the writer wrote, talked about a lot of, of surveillance where not only are they surveilling us from above, but it's going to require more surveillance of, by us of the authorities from below. And so that's where the transparency comes in that we should have access to, it should be much easier to requisition any footage that is caught uh, by police and, and to be able to surveil what they're doing. Like it, it, this, the road has to go both ways if, if we're headed down that it's path. It's messy though. I mean, I'm for that. Dangerous future. 
I'm for that. But, you know, do you want to have access when the cops go and investigate a sexual child abuse case? Um, you know, people are having the worst day of their lives and cops are going into their home. I don't, you know, it shouldn't be, I want transparency, but at some point there's a matter of privacy as well. Um, and it's hard to, you know, these are tough rules and regulations and, and, and decisions to make about this stuff. But mm -hmm. the other, I think perhaps an overarching point about surveillance, um, it's, it is by its nature reactive. You know, the video in a bodega can identify um, who the killer is, um, in part because that person is almost assuredly already in the system and, you know, facial recognition comes into play in that. Um, gang databases can come in and play that. And of course, people are, you know, some people are fighting all these things because they don't want policing. Um, but it, they're, they're reactive in nature. Uh, and ultimately, police can be proactive and prevent crime. And that requires men and women um, using brains and using their intelligence. And, you know, again, that tough part of good leadership is making sure it doesn't go overboard. Um, there's a constant problem in policing of the statistical tail wagging the dog. Um, you have to think, why are you doing this? What's the goal? And the goal never should be, well, I made an arrest. I mean, unless actually after the fact that might be the goal uh but as a in terms of proactive policing you have to figure out what what are we trying to accomplish and how do we accomplish that um but that's never going to be done um solely with cameras and, and and surveillance at some point it does involve um you know physically arresting somebody we can't we can't get away from that and, and i would argue we don't we shouldn't we don't want to but um the surveillance and, and technology part and I, I think it's sort of we need that discussion, but we shouldn't let it distract from um, the core of actual good legal, moral, constitutional policing. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk through that with us today. Um, this is I, I feel like there are a lot more people finding common ground on these issues where it was more uh, polarized and you're pro or anti-police before. And the more that there can be a consensus that, well, we want some definition, some workable definition of good policing that actually respects civil liberties. That's the, the conversation that I, I hope continues to develop and then be enacted into policy because we really uh, we we need that. Um, and I, I appreciate you participating with us. Um, I wanted you to close this out. Could yeah, I just please. go on what you just said? Because it's really important sure. um, yeah. to focus on good policing. We only generally from the outside focus on bad policing. Mm -hmm. um, and we often focus on bad policing in places like New York, we're generally compared to a place like Ferguson, Missouri, um, the NYPD does a much better job. Um, not a perfect job by any means, um, but by focusing on good police, we, we can try to propagate those best practices. Um, there's very little on that. We, we do tend to go from sort of outrage to outrage, and that doesn't really necessarily, and they might be outrageous. Like I'm not saying we shouldn't focus on some of those outrages, yeah. um, but that's not how you improve the system. Yes, accountability right. and improvement is is what we want, and um, yeah, that's that's very well put. Uh, before we wrap, I did want to mention that uh, Liz and I have set up uh, an email address, just asking questions at reason .com. We hope to add a just ask us questions segment to the show. So if you have you know a good direct question for either or both of us, please send it to there. You can also DM me on Twitter. That's fine. Um, Peter Moskos, thanks for talking with us today. Oh, thanks. This was a great conversation. <laughs> thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.